Well, good afternoon. Is everyone awake? All right, we're going to keep you awake because this is important. Um, my name is Sonal Shah. I am the CEO of the Texas Tribune. And I want to thank you all for coming today. It's such an important, this is one of our most important events that we do. And uh, we love having this conversation because we know there's so much happening in parts of all the parts of Texas. And we want to have this conversation with all of you. Um, as you may know, we are 15 years old this year. So we're very excited. And more than that, as we, are, as we turn 15, we are also expanding into starting local newsrooms across Texas because we know that the most important thing we can do is make sure there's local news for local communities. Uh, we've started our first newsroom in Waco, and we'll be starting in other parts of Texas soon, so please stay tuned with us. But we love Texas, and we want to make sure the thing that we do, and our biggest priority, is covering Texas for Texans. And we want people outside of Texas to hear from Texas, not from outside of Texas. So uh, it's, why we, it's why it's important for us, and it's why it's important that we have this conversation with you. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Nick Garcia, our region's editor. We are excited about this conversation. And again, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Texas, Tr Texas Tribune's Rural Symposium, y'all. We are so excited to have you here to discuss the future of rural Texas. As Sonal said, I am Nick Garcia. I'm the region's editor at the Texas Tribune. My team of reporters is tasked with telling the story of Texas, the Lone Star State, from communities outside of our major metro regions. They live in Lubbock, Lufkin, Odessa, and McAllen, and they share the stories from those cities and the surrounding areas. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, a more formal welcome will take place this evening at 6 p.m. when we have our opening uh, keynote conversation. If you have not checked in yet, and I'm pretty sure you all have, but if you haven't, uh, please make sure you do so in the lobby with one of my Texas Tribune colleagues. And while you are there, please be sure to participate in our MAP activity, letting us know where you are from. Following our uh, first event, these rounds of lightning talks at 3.30 today, we're going to have a partner program presented by the Lone Star Economic Alliance titled Protecting Rural Economies with a slate of lawmakers, including Representative Ken King, uh, Ryan Galeen, Senator-elect Brent uh, Hagenbach, and Representative Angelica Orr. At 6 p.m., Texas Tribune Editor-in-Chief, my boss, uh, Matthew Watkins will be moderating a panel of rural Texas lawmakers about the 89th legislature. And then following the program, we are going to have a reception at 7 p.m. in the theater lobby. We hope you all will join us for some uh, food and cocktails. So as editor, I get to travel across the state and meet folks from towns big and small. One concern I've heard across the state is that our smallest towns often feel left behind. They are so far behind, they often don't even know where to begin to get caught up. There is a sense of total paralysis in many communities. There are, however, success stories. Downtowns in rural Texas are being rebuilt. Ranchers and farmers are being part of the technical revolution. And there is new infrastructure coming. We all know the saying, big things come in small packages. This brought us to the theme of this year's event, Big, small towns, big possibilities, because we know anything is possible in Texas. To kick things off, we wanted to offer an inspirational note. We set out to create a series of lightning talks from folks who know how to get investments into small towns, into communities like yours. I asked each presenter to come here with a story, with practical tips, whether you are a mayor, a librarian, a teacher, a parent or an otherwise engaged Texan with practical tips that you can put into place in your own communities. Each of these guests will have real examples of how they worked with folks like you to make communities even better. Kicking us off will be Kelty Garby with the Texas Rural Funders, followed by Monica Cruz with the Texas Demographic Center. 
We're going to have Betty Soto from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Amanda Weinstein with the Center of Rural Innovation, Marco Bontello with Humanities Texas, and Amanda Wickman with the Southwest Ag Center at UT Tyler, followed by uh, Vanessa Puig Williams with the Texas Water Program for the Environmental Defense Fund. If you hear something that inspires you today, please be sure to find one of our speakers to network after this event uh, at one of our receptions. There is also plenty of handouts uh, with more information from each of these speakers at the table with all of the uh, cows on it. You can't miss it. Um, so please, at this moment in time, uh, join me in welcoming Kelty from the Texas Rural Funders. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kelty Garby, Executive Director of Texas Rural Funders. Um, the mission of Texas Rural Funders is to mobilize the power of philanthropy to strengthen rural Texas. So we're very proud to be a sponsor of this event today. Um, but one of the things that is central to our work um, is our belief that urban and rural are inextricably linked. At the same time, we know that there are some unique aspects of life in rural Texas. So when we were getting ready for this presentation today, we brainstormed a few things that would um, indicate that you know you live in rural Texas if. So I'm going to share a few of these with you all. and. Um, when I meet you, hopefully at the reception or tomorrow at some of the events, um, if you have examples of things that show you know you live in rural Texas if, I'd love to hear those. Um, so the first one is your elementary, middle, and high school are all on the same campus. The second one, you can name and have met your county judge. The next one I know all of us are working on, you or your neighbors have slow or maybe no internet. And finally, your neighborhood has more cows than people. Um, so we know not all of these apply to all rural communities, but we wanted to share those um, as we move into talking about some of the resources Texas Rural Funders has created. So we are a membership organization of funders who care about rural Texas. Um, so we're not a new funder, we're a collection of funders, some of whom you may already know. Um, but there's a number of resources that the funders um, have supported Texas Rural Funders in creating. So I wanna, um, if you have picked this up, um, some of them were passed out or they're on the front table. This lists the resources and I'm just going to talk you through a few of those. Um, first is we have a monthly newsletter called The Roundup that is full of grants, events, conferences, partnerships, um, and your stories. So uh, we always invite rural communities who have something that they're proud of or working on to share that with us so that we can highlight it in our newsletter. Um, all of those things also go to live on our website once they're in the newsletter in a section called Rural Resources. Um, some people know us only as a broadband organization, so I would be remiss if I didn't point out that one of the sections here is Broadband Resources. Um, but the most interesting thing that we've created um, and that we're getting really positive feedback on in the past year is our Grants Hub. So on the other side of this card, um, the Grants Hub is a list of grants, federal, state, local, private funders um, that's updated each month. It's also complemented by a list of vetted grant writers with experience writing grants for rural Texas communities. And then as I mentioned, the last component is the rural resources. Um, we also at Texas Rural Funders um, regularly create resources um, as we learn about really great things that are happening in communities that can and should be replicated. Um, so one of our most recent publications is boosting broadband with E-Rate, showing how different rural communities, um, the schools and libraries are using that federal funding to increase broadband access. We also put out a publication called Planting Seeds of Prosperity, How Community Development Financial Institutions Can Transform Rural Texas. And this is a really interesting resource because it is both a tool for our funders um, who want to work with their boards to bring CDFIs, as they're called, to operate in rural communities. Um, there are many CDFIs that operate in Texas but the vast majority of them are operating in urban areas and we have a number of funders 
interested in and working to bring CDFIs to rural communities. And why this is important is because it's more than giving a grant. Um, it can unlock other forms of capital, um, such as loans, and be reinvested over and over in a different way than a grant. Um, and what we're working on in time for the upcoming legislative session is a broadband and water workforce analysis because um, if you've paid attention to what um, federal funding is coming down for broadband and water, there's a huge set of resources and opportunities coming to Texas. But in water, we know that there's an aging workforce. And in broadband, we know that there will be grants to different parts of the state and we don't have enough trained professionals to build all of the broadband that's coming. So this will be a set of recommendations in time for the legislative session. So um, I would love to connect with you all afterwards, um, but pick up this card and it has QR codes and you can access any of these resources. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Monica Cruz, and I serve as the State Data Center Lead for the Texas Demographic Center. I grew up in rural South Texas in a small town called Los Fresnos in the Rio Grande Valley. You may have heard about my town because you may have gotten a speeding ticket on your way to South Padre Island one day. <laughs> so I'm very familiar with the cultural richness of rural communities because it has shaped the person that I am today. The Texas Demographic Center was established in 2001 during the 77th legislative session. And it is, it, we are directed to produce two main products. The first is we produce annual population estimates for Texas counties and municipalities and biannual population projections for the state of Texas and our counties. In fact, we just released our 2023 population estimates if you visit our website. We have a close relationship with the US Census Bureau and we highlight the demographic trends in Texas with data that is useful to public policymakers. We're housed out of the University of Texas in San Antonio, so we welcome you. And we also have an office in the Capital State Complex. Our state demographer is Dr. Lloyd Potter, and he'll be joining you here tomorrow. Between 2010 and 2020, Texas grew more than any other state in the US. We ranked number one on numeric growth, and we have continued to rank number one on numeric growth every year since then. We currently have a population of 30.5 million but we also know that the population in Texas is not evenly distributed. 87% of the population in Texas is concentrated east of IH35 and also along the Texas Triangle, as we know very well as Dallas-Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston areas. But we also know that there's tremendous growth on what we call the suburban ring counties, which are those counties immediately adjacent to those high population density metro areas. And those counties are growing at a very fast rate, often ranking among the top 10 on growth rates in the country. In Texas, we have 254 counties, but 181 of them, or 70% of them, have a population that's less than 50,000. 152 out of our 254 counties have a population of less than 25,000. When we look at the counties between 25,000 and 50,000, we see that they're mainly adjacent to those suburban ring counties outside of those fast growing metro areas. Texas living, Texans living in rural counties are more likely to be employed in natural resources, construction, and maintenance, and are more likely to be self-employed than Texas living 
Texans living in urban counties. The median age of Texans living in rural counties is 40 years, compared to 36 years for all of Texas. I'd like to offer two recommendations uh, on how you and we can collectively support rural communities. The first is use data to tell your story. When we respond to data requests from elected officials and organizations and cities, we often use data from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. The ACS, as it is also known, is, uh, provides trillions of dollars uh, trillions of federal and state dollars are distributed using data from the ACS. Government entities use this to understand the demographic profile of residents they serve. The ACS has 40 different topics of data and variables, including family structure, income, language needs, educational attainment, poverty, employment, health insurance, internet usage, housing costs, to name a few. Also, the Texas Demographic Center, we create some great interactive data tools. One of the more popular ones that we have on our website is called What's Driving Population Change in Texas Counties? We use the data, population data, to better understand what is happening in each individual county around mi migration, whether population change is being affected by in or out migration, and or natural change, which is related to births and deaths. So I encourage you to look for our interactive tools on our website. The second point is, I, and recommendation I'd like to make is to use data for grant making and policy making. Just as Kelty just shared, there's funding out there, but if you don't know where to look for the data, come to us. As I said, ACS informs how money is spent. Data and demographic profiles can provide value, valuable information so that resources and services can be tailored to best serve the needs of individuals and families living in rural, in rural Texas. The Texas Demographic Center has strong relationships with various state agencies and organizations around the state. So if we don't have the data that you need, we can help you find it. Rural Texas is strong and resilient. And the Texas Demographic Center is here to help you tell your data story to serve your community. We are a state entity created to serve the public, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Betty Soto, the area director, filling in for Daniel Torres, the state director for USDA Rural Development in Texas. USDA touches the lives of all Americans each day in many positive ways. USDA Rural Development administers over 50 financial assistance programs for a variety of rural applications and has 23 area offices located in USDA service centers throughout Texas. USDA Rural Development provides direct loans, loan guarantees, and grants to help expand economic opportunities, create jobs, and improve the quality of life for millions of Americans in rural areas. This assistance supports the infrastructure improvements, business development, housing, community facilities, such as schools, public safety, health care, and high-speed internet access in rural, tribal, and high-poverty areas. USDA's programs are designed to provide rural communities, especially those that have been historically underserved, the resources and support they need to make their communities attractive and economically viable places to live and work now and for generations to come. The rural development programs and services, the agency offers assistance to meet the unique needs and challenges of each rural community. Throughout the country, agricultural producers and small rural businesses are facing high energy costs that are having an adverse impact on their bottom line. 
To address this issue over the past couple of years, USDA Rural Development has made historic investments in infrastructure and clean energy capabilities in rural America. USDA is supporting rural small business owners and agriculture producers across Texas in lowering energy costs and expanding their businesses through the Rural Energy for America program. The REAP program provides grant funding and guaranteed loan financing to agricultural producers and rural small businesses for renewable energy and energy efficiency improvements that will help rural businesses owners lower energy costs, generate new income, and strengthen their resiliency of operations. The REAP program has been in existence for about 20 years, but there have been some recent enhancements that have made it more attractive than have resulted in increased application activity. REAP assistance is available in rural areas. For the purpose of the program, a rural area is defined as any area of a state, not in a city or town, that has a population of more than 50,000 inhabitants, not in the urbanized area contiguous and adjacent to a city or town that has a population of more than 50,000 inhabitants. I know that's a lot of information, but there should be an eligibility map on the website. There is a useful online mapping tool that is available for interested parties to determine if the location of their proposed project is in an eligible rural area. An applicant must also meet the definition of either an agricultural producer or a rural small business. Agricultural producers with at least 50% of their gross income coming from agricultural operations are eligible. The small business definition is derived from the Small Business Administration, SBA, and the uses the table of size standards. Small business determinations are made using the size of applicant entity alone and the size of the entity combined with other entities it controls or entities it is controlled by. Funds may be used to purchase, um, install, and construct of renewable energy systems or purchase installation and construction of energy efficiency improvements. Renewable energy is defined as an energy derived from wind, solar, renewable biomass, ocean, geothermal, or hydroelectric source. A RES, which is the renewable energy system, application can be for either replacement of energy use or energy generation. An energy efficiency improvement is defined as improvements to or replacement of an existing building or systems or equipment, I'm sorry, owned by the applicant that reduces energy consumption of an annual basis. An energy audit or energy assessment is required, which shows energy savings as a result of the proposed improvements. Examples include, but are not limited to the lighting, refrigeration, heating, uh, the ventilation and cooling, automated controls, and insulation. Grant requests can cover up to 50% federal grant, share of total eligible project cost. The maximum grant request size is 500,000 for energy efficiency improvements and a million for renewable energy systems. This is one of the enhancements that I mentioned. Maximum grant limits have been increased from 250 for the energy efficiency and 500,000 for the renewable energy. There is no maximum total project size. The applicant determines what percent of grant funds to apply for up to the maximum federal grant shares and grant request amounts. The grant amount is based on total project cost filed at the time of application. Loan guarantees on loans up to 75% of the total eligible project cost. Applications are accepted year round by USDA Rural Development Offices and awards are typically made on a quarterly basis. Once an application is received by the agency, all documents are reviewed, a technical merit review is performed and an environmental review is initiated by the agency. USDA continues to accept REAP applications and has set aside a portion of the program funds to support underutilized renewable energy technologies like wind and geothermal power. 
Complete applications are considered for funding in the next available funding competition. Applications compete for funds on their total project score. This problem helps increase American energy independence by increasing the private sector supply of renewable energy and by decreasing the demand of energy through energy efficiency improvements. Over time, these investments can also help lower energy costs for small businesses and agricultural producers. And if you would like additional information about USDA Rural Development Programs, feel free to email me at betty.soto at usda.gov. And I will also leave some handouts about these two programs and the application process out front. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm the Director of Research at the Center on Rural Innovation, where our work and our mission focuses on creating opportunities that empower rural people to benefit and thrive from the tech economy. My job as Director of Research is to make sure that our policies and our programs and our data supports this mission and what we do. And when we look at the data, for rural America, here's what we see. We see that the gap between rural and urban America has been growing for decades. Rural America has not yet recovered from the Great Recession of 2008. When we look at why, what we see is that larger economic trends have disproportionately negatively affected rural America. These include things like automation, globalization, and the decline in entrepreneurship all disproportionately negatively affect jobs in rural America. But the story that's not being told about rural America or that you hear less often when we see this growing gap is that rural America has benefited less from the rise in the tradable services sector. This includes jobs like tech jobs. Rural America is home to 12% of the nation's workforce, but less than 5% of the nation's tech workforce. We find that rural America is missing an estimated 80,000 tech jobs in existing businesses. That means existing businesses in rural America aren't hiring tech workers, can't find tech workers, or are doing without. And our surveys show that it's not that rural workers aren't interested in tech. Our surveys show that they are just as interested in tech work, but they don't have access to resources. They don't have access to training, workforce development, especially non-traditional training for tech careers. When we look at those same surveys, despite declines in entrepreneurship across the country, especially so in rural America, Rural Americans are actually more interested in entrepreneurship and starting their own business than non-rural America. Rural America is home to 12% of the nation's businesses, but less than 6% are in the tech industry. Why? When we look at where things like venture capital, which helps fund startups and helps them scale and grow, only 2% of venture capital is going to rural America. 98% is going to non-rural America. Among that 98%, more than half is going to just five large metro areas. We are investing in the same places, in the same people, and expecting new ideas. At some point, it's not gonna work out. At the Center on Rural Innovation, we're helping to address this through our innovation fund, where we have funded various tech startups in various sectors, including ag tech, aerospace, a company who has started to make the services more streamlined for our auto shops and dealerships, healthcare sector. We are investing in the ideas and the companies in rural America where most VC has forgotten about. 
when we see the components necessary, when we look at those components necessary in rural America to grow a dynamic economy, to grow a tech sector and the tradable services sector, what we see is rural America is left without the resources that it needs to grow this new dynamic economy. These are resources that you've already heard like broadband. We still see a rural urban gap in broadband. It's been improving, which is great, but it needs to go further. And we don't just need to lay down those broadband lines. We need to leverage them. It's not just about getting the infrastructure. It's about the getting the infrastructure and using it for that community. A recent study that we just put out shows that when small towns leverage that broadband, they see business growth rates that are 213% higher. For small towns in the lowest broadband utilization group, they see declines. It is important that we not only lay that broadband, but leverage it so that businesses and startups and workers have what they need, the support that they need to get tech jobs, to start those new startups, so that we get more ideas that are out there right now in rural America. How do we do this work? This work relies on partnerships. We work with communities across the country, and we work with those communities. Those communities come to us so that we can help build their leadership capacity. Most rural communities don't have a slew of grant writers. Most rural communities don't have an economist like me to share the data and to share the trends and to see where they're falling behind. We work with these communities to build up the partnerships, to leverage the assets they have, and to create new assets that they might not yet have. Things like incubator hubs and business accelerators and co-working spaces where we can provide more businesses, more startups, the support they need, and give them access to those funds. We also work on networking all of our communities so that they're leveraging the insights not only from our research and our data and our programs, but also from each other, seeing how they can grow this new economy. But it relies on funding. We rely on funding from a variety of sources, philanthropic funding, private funding, and federal funding. In East Texas, that funding looked like the TLL Temple Foundation, where their goal is to help East Texas, help those rural areas grow. They've funded our work in areas like Nacogdoches, where we can start to build up those partnerships and build up those assets so that they have the resources they need to pivot into the tradable services sector, into getting more of those tech jobs. And what we do is to help people help themselves. A lot of these areas have what they need or are missing a few components, like a non-traditional workforce program. We have seen success with rural workers accessing new programs so that they can get those tech jobs and start those tech companies, exciting tech companies of ideas that we have not yet heard. So I have a pamphlet or a little note outside if you'd like for more information. Uh, about the Center on Rural Innovation and what we do. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I am Marco Buentello, Director of Grants at Humanities Texas. I have the somewhat challenging but privileged and rewarding job of awarding grants to libraries, museums, cultural organizations, cities and counties all across Texas. I see it as my duty to get these awards and funds out to every corner of the state, especially small towns and rural areas. I'm excited to be here as just last month, our board approved a new rural grant line, which I will get into soon. I'd like to start by introducing my organization Humanities Texas is the State Humanities Council. We are a private nonprofit based in Austin, but we have a statewide reach. We have board members from all across the state, including Amarillo, Midland, Longview, Hearst, Fort Worth, and here in San Antonio, just to name a few of our communities that our board members are from. We provide trainings and resources for middle school and high school teachers. We have a circulating traveling exhibition program uh, we offer public programs for 
families and veterans across the state. We do several um, different kinds of programming, and I would invite you to please follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter to learn more about our programming and how we can impact your community. So all of our work centers the humanities, and our mission is to promote lifelong learning in the humanities. What does that mean exactly? Well, we want Texans to engage with history, culture, heritage, literature, philosophy, and all of the other wonderful things that make us human. In terms of our grants program, we provide funding for public programming in the humanities. So what this can look like is a public lecture or discussion on history or culture, a panel discussion, a book reading and discussion, film screenings. Uh, we can fund conferences and we can fund media uh, projects such as a documentary or a podcast. Our service to rural Texas over the past five years has been fairly impactful. We have awarded 190 grants in rural areas, and we're currently defining rural as counties with 45,000 people or fewer. These 190 grants over the past five years have gone to 100 different organizations in rural Texas to 80 different small towns and communities. And these grants over the past five years account for roughly $900,000 of our budget. Um, if you can, you can probably tell that 900,000 to 290 organizations are fairly small grants. These are grants of $2,000 to $5,000 for grassroots organizations. But really, we really see that as our bread and butter, awarding uh, small and accessible grants to grassroots organizations across the state. I'd like to just give two examples of recent grants that we've given to rural Texas. One is the Museum of the West Texas Frontier in Stamford. This museum was able to survive the economic uncertainty of the pandemic with one of our relief grants. They then received a $20,000 major, uh, $20, major grant from us, and they were able to update and revitalize their existing history exhibition. We've since learned that they were able to leverage our funds to get $20,000 in private funding, and we've learned that their museum has now become a destination for rural counties all across uh, Texas. An, an example of a mini grant that we've given recently is to the Wallace Theater in Leveland. They were able to rent one of our exhibitions with this mini grant. They invited middle, middle school students to create their own exhibition related to this uh, traveling exhibition, and it was on World War II history. They also supplemented this program with a lecture from a local community college professor. So we have in this an example of, of an arts uh, organization that is using our funds to expand their programming and to offer historical and educational content for their community. And they've become a producer and destination for educational content. Just this week, Humanities Texas will award too many grants in rural towns, um, one to an organization in Gilmer and another to an organization in Jacksonville. So my team and I work every day with rural organizations, as you can tell. We get valuable feedback from them. Uh, one obvious point of feedback that we get is, hey, we need more money, we need more support. We're small libraries and museums, uh, and that, that is uh, one obvious point of feedback, of course. But another thing we hear is that with the funding that they do have and with small grants, they are able to carry out important and valuable programs for their community, programs that are impactful. Uh, I would, we see in my work that humanities programming can help unite a, a rural community and can help sustain a rural community. And I would like to offer two arguments here for you today. Um, one is that humanities programming in rural areas can help the local economy. Libraries, museums, cultural and educational centers all generate jobs in tourism for a small town. I would also say, and maybe just as importantly, that the humanities can generate community. You cannot have a community without history, heritage, and culture. And we find that even a small program that can help a community discover its history, to tell its own story, and to discover new cultures. What can we do today to help rural organizations and rural communities? I would at first ask you to spread the word about these opportunities that Humanities Texas offers. Please talk to your local library, your local museum, your arts museum, cultural center, education center. You have historic buildings downtown. Talk to your mayor, your county judge, your chamber of commerce. 
they would all be eligible for this kind of funding and would be eligible to carry out humanities programming in your area. I would also ask you to check in on these organizations. It may be that they not only need funding support, but they may need administrative support. If you are a volunteer, a local leader, a philanthropist, please check in with your local library and museum. They might even need help writing a grant, for example. I would also take a moment to lobby for the humanities and cultural sector of your community. If you're a local leader or philanthropist, think about your humanities and cultural sector as you're planning uh, funding or revitalization plans in your community. I'll end by uh, mentioning the, the rural grant. We are really excited to announce that we will launch a rural grant in February of next year. This grant will cover $2,500 for public programming in the humanities. We are planning a simplified application for small organizations, and importantly, we will not require any cost share for this grant. Uh, we are so excited to announce this, and please contact me if you have any questions about this, this new grant that we will launch soon. As I stated earlier, please follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter, uh, and talk to me throughout the week. I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Wickman, and I am the program director for the Southwest Center for Agricultural Health, Injury Prevention, and Education. We are currently one of 12 centers that are funded across the U.S. that conduct research and outreach to reduce injuries and fatalities to agricultural workers and their families. But today, I'm going to share a story with you. It's not my story, but it's an important story. So let's take a trip. It was a dry, dusty day in West Texas when Grant Heinrich received a text message. He was already holding his phone like a lot of us are doing probably right now. So he glanced down to see what it was, and then he realized what he was holding, what he was reading. It was a suicide note of sorts, a final goodbye from one of his farmhands. And realizing that this had just come in, that the person was still alive right now, Grant sprung into action. He ran from his office, he jumped in the car, he sped down the dirt road to the farm, he started calling everyone else that was working that day, saying, check the barns, check the tractors, check the farm trucks, find this man. And Grant found him first. He was sitting alone in a building with a gun in his mouth, and he was crying. And as grim as the scene was, Grant was relieved because he had found him in time. And he went and he sat down next to him and they shared and they talked and he put the gun down and ultimately everyone got to go home safe that day. Unfortunately, this was not the first time that Grant had come into contact with suicide and suicidal ideation. Grant lost an uncle and two cousins to suicide. One of those cousins he was very close with. It was his role model, his superman, and that young man lost, lost his life on Grant's birthday. And these deaths, just like you can imagine, rocked his family's foundation, really cracked it. And they spent a long time trying to rebuild. And Grant really wanted to make sure that this never happened again. Grant was brave enough to come forward and tell this scary, sometimes embarrassing, sometimes awkward story with our center. And we captured it in one of our testimonial videos in the Home Safe Home series. And you can actually hear the whole story in Grant's own words by scanning this QR code on the handout that's out in the lobby. But Grant recognized something important that this is happening more and more, and it's hard for people in agriculture to seek help when they need it. The truth is, the people who work in agriculture are tough. They are problem solvers. They deal with challenges every single day, and they're coming up with solutions. But sometimes it's difficult to seek help for depression and anxiety when you need it. 
a lot of the things that make or break an agricultural operation are completely out of the control of the owner-operator. We're talking about weather, market prices, politics. You can do everything right. You can manage your money well, you can manage your labor force well, you can work from before the sun comes up till after the sun goes down, and then one weather event, one flood, one wildfire, one hurricane comes through, a tornado wipes out this entire season's crop, and you're back at square one. This kind of lifestyle, although amazing and fulfilling, can lead to chronic stress the kind of stress that you can't just bounce back from. We want people to start seeing depression, anxiety, and stress just as they would see diabetes or high blood pressure. These are all treatable conditions. They have a diagnosis. They have a treatment plan. Some of them have medication. But it's time for us to stop thinking about them in a negative light. Here's the hard, cold facts. Those people who work in agriculture have much higher rates of substance use, diabetes, and completed suicide. Farmers in the last two decades have seen a rise in suicide rates by 40%. We are not going to make a positive impact on these trends unless we break down the stigma surrounding mental health, and we can start doing that by seeking help when we need it and talking about it. All of this is why the AgriStress Helpline exists. So our organization, with funding and support from the Texas Department of Agriculture and the AgriSafe Network, launched the AgriStress Helpline in February of 22. This helpline is not only a crisis intervention hotline, but it's also a resource hotline. So if you did lose all of your hay and you're trying to find replacement hay to feed the cows, they can also point you in the right direction for that. But they can also handle a suicide crisis. The reason this line is different than say 988 or any other line is that it is designed specifically for the rural and agricultural community. The people who answer this line have taken a course called Farm Response and they are culturally competent. They know that a farmer can't just take a vacation to recharge or hire a lot more help to help them get through a hard time or when the work has piled up. They are not going to offer advice that is impractical or that a farmer or rancher can't actually take advantage of. We need your help to let people know that this is available, to start breaking down that stigma, the internal stigma the, the little voice in your head that says, I don't want people to think I'm weak. The external stigma that says, I don't want other people to see me differently or treat me differently. We have to break all of that down and continue talking about why this is so difficult and how we can fix it. And we also need to seek help when we need it and point our friends and our family in the right direction when they need help. All of you can do your part. Everyone here can help break down the stigma of mental health, and help point people in the right direction. Because all you have to do is call, or text even. Help is in your hands, and these hard, awkward conversations today can prevent tragedy tomorrow. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Pug Williams, and I work for Environmental Defense Fund, or EDF. I lead our water program here in Texas, where I was born and raised. I grew up in Houston. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, but I did spend a lot of time in rural Texas growing up, visiting my great aunt's farm in Navasota. She did not have running water, and I can remember watching her as a kid. Uh, go outside and use a hand pump to fill a bucket of water from a well right outside her door. That was my introduction to groundwater, I suppose. If you're from rural Texas, you know how central groundwater is to our way of life. The water from your well, just like my great aunt's, is literally life. 
and the backbone of rural Texas. Our whole farming community depends on it. Nearly three quarters of the water used for agriculture comes from groundwater. It is also the only source of drinking water for many rural towns. Even when you throw in all the urban areas across the state, groundwater remains the largest source of water for Texas. And it has never been more threatened. We've grown twice as fast as the rest of the country this past decade, and our population is expected to double in the next 50 years. All of the, those new straws in our aquifers mean our finite supply of groundwater is declining, in some places rapidly. We can't stay on this trajectory. I don't want to imagine a Texas without the Devil's River, without San Solomon Springs and Balmeray, without the Blanco. But unfortunately, it's not imaginary. Our rivers are no longer flowing year-round in some parts of the state, and rural groundwater wells are increasingly vulnerable. My work at UDF is focused um, on ensuring that our water supplies, particularly groundwater, are managed sustainably to meet the needs of both people and nature. This is no easy task given that our state is becoming increasingly hot and dry and people just will not stop moving here. Making sure that Texas has enough water in the future will require funding for a number of solutions that state leaders are contemplating from developing new water supplies, incentivizing conservation and wastewater reuse, and fixing water infrastructure like leaky pipes. What often gets left out of these conversations, however, is groundwater. And you can help us change that. First, though, it is important to understand the history of how we got here. Texas is infamous for the rule of capture. Every time I give a talk on groundwater, somebody asks me about it. It's a legal doctrine that says if my neighbor pumps groundwater from his land and dries up my well, I cannot sue him for damages. It was adopted almost 125 years ago by the Texas Supreme Court during a time when there were 27 million fewer people who called Texas home, and rural Texas was not nearly as fragmented. So landowners didn't have to worry about impacting their neighbors beyond their fence line. No one could have Im imagined that 125 years later, 30 million people would be living here. In 1949, in response to severe groundwater declines in the High Plains, the legislature created groundwater conservation districts, or GCDs, local entities with authority to manage groundwater. Interestingly, urban interests initially proposed the idea of putting groundwater management under the state's control which obviously did not go over well with the High Plains farmers. As one local farmer exclaimed at a meeting, I favor no control, but if we must have it, let it be local. And so, in that rural Texas spirit, Texas's preferred method of managing groundwater, local management, was born, where rural Texans have a say. Management looks a little different depending on the groundwater conservation district that you are in. The legislature has given GCDs broad authority to regulate groundwater given local conditions and uses. And so the 99 GCDs that cover about two thirds of our state and that have been created so far do things a bit differently with various levels of funding and resources. All GCDs though must use the best available science to protect property rights because in Texas groundwater is owned by landowners and they must balance the conservation and development of groundwater. This is an extremely difficult balancing act for groundwater districts. It feels a bit like when my two boys were little, if my husband gave them a cake and said, the cake belongs to each of you boys, and each of you have a right to eat it. And then he asked me to figure out how to divvy it up. Of course, I'd split it fairly in half, but we can't really do that with aquifers, can we? GCDs have an impossible challenge. They are tasked with managing a resource that is both simultaneously shared and privately owned by landowners in Texas. Compounding this challenge is the unrelenting growth and drought that Texas is facing. 
many newcomers are moving to subdivisions that were once ranches in areas of the state that don't have a lot of water in the first place or any development regulations. And they are now watering lawns instead of cattle. The source for these new homes, the source of water for these new homes will be groundwater, of course, and GCDs will have to figure out how to manage under these increasingly difficult conditions. The solution rests in data and science. To effectively manage groundwater and balance competing interests, GCDs need to understand how the aquifers they manage function and how increased groundwater pumping and less recharge from Texas's drying climate affect the longevity of this critical water supply. Then they must make hard decisions, and they often get sued for them, about how to manage this precious resource. They can choose to do so sustainably or not. Aquifers are critical pieces of water infrastructure in Texas. I'll say that again because I don't think a lot of people really think about that. Aquifers are infrastructure. Like the pipes that transport water to households and cities, aquifers provide water to farms, ranches, and countless rural communities. The state is spending billions of dollars on water infrastructure projects, which are important and needed. But these projects are only part of the solution to Texas's water challenges. Proactively managing groundwater resources is another. Unfortunately, though, it seems like groundwater gets left behind. Very little state funding is available to GCDs to support management of their community's water supply and to protect privately owned groundwater. And so decisions to issue permits are often made with blindfolds on without an understanding of how current levels of groundwater pumping will impact the future of the aquifer and the people who depend on it. We cannot ignore groundwater any longer. Maybe our tagline needs to be, make groundwater great again. Okay, I got a few laughs. I was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering how that would go over. Uh, so how can we do this? With partners like the Texas Alliance of Groundwater Conservation Districts and the Texas Farm Bureau, EDF is building a coalition to press the state this upcoming legislative session to create a new GCD grant program that will fund the development of local data and scientific studies, and we would welcome your support. If you are a rural landowner, business owner, or community member, your voice matters. Show up and participate in your local groundwater district and advocate for what matters to you. And finally, meet with your state representatives and let them know how important groundwater is to you, to your family, to your way of life in rural Texas, because the future of rural Texas hinges on whether we get groundwater management right. Thank you. How about one more round of applause for all of our presenters? Hopefully you all are already inspired. Um, that concludes our uh, round of lightning talks. Uh, all of our uh, speakers are sticking around uh, during this break to network. They also brought handouts again. Look for the table with the cows on it. Uh, you cannot miss it. Uh, please be back at 3.30 for our partner program, Protecting Rural Economies by the Lone Star Alliance. And we will see you all soon. Thank you. <laughs>